Ever since it was crowned Drive's overall Car of the Year champion in 2014, the Mercedes-Benz C-Class has stood virtually unchallenged in the junior luxury segment. But now the baby Merc faces its toughest opposition yet, with the new Jaguar XE and Lexus IS200T, along with the updated BMW 3 Series and Audi A4. This is almost like the perfect storm for luxury car buyers. Four new or heavily updated offerings have landed in a frenetic 12 month period, all designed to take on the undisputed king, Mercedes C-Class. The criteria for this comparison is fairly straightforward. Five petrol powered, four cylinder sedans, each priced under $70,000. Keyless entry and start, satellite navigation, reversing cameras and sensors, climate control, Bluetooth connectivity and LED daytime running lights are standard fare across all five cars, making it easy to see why this segment is on the rise. First cab off the rank is the Audi A4, and what a first impression it makes. Despite seemingly minimal changes to the exterior styling, the B9 generation A4 boasts larger interior proportions, which endow it with the most usable cabin and boot space of any competitor. Then there's the immaculately presented dashboard and door trims, complete with lashings of leather and Alcantara, and unmistakable German build quality. The caveat is that a lot of the interior bling you see here is listed as optional extras. The A4 featured is priced from $69,900 and is the only vehicle to be fitted with all-wheel drive traction along with class equaling power of 185 kilowatts. Not surprisingly, it's that Quattro all-wheel drive system and two-litre engine that are the star of the show inside this Audi. Now, it has the same claimed 0900 time of 5.8 seconds as the BMW, but it feels lively off the line. The engine's really willing, and it finds its peak torque really low down in the rev range. The drawback from that is that the Audi is a little bit lurchy off the line. It doesn't always get its takeoffs right, so it sort of hesitates a little bit, and the dual-clutch transmission feels a little bit grabby as it takes off. But once you're up and running, it is a really nice composed drivetrain, really sensible, quite economic as well. Um, we've averaged about 7 litres per 100 kilometres in real world conditions, so that's fairly impressive. As for the rest of the package, it's typical Audi. Very Teutonic interior as we mentioned before. The steering, uh, handling and overall ride and everything are really well calibrated. It has to be one of the sportiest offerings in this class. It does a really good job of transitioning between comfort driving and sporty driving, courtesy of the drive select system. So if I change to the most aggressive dynamic mode, the engine picks up straight away. All of a sudden you've got media steering to play with, firmer adaptive dampers, and a more sporty demeanor overall. The downside is that the Audi is then more prone to skipping over bumps mid-corner, unlike the Jaguar, which is sort of composed in all conditions. Um, and it's a little bit more highly strung. So it does cater to both ends of the spectrum, but there are drawbacks um, depending on which driving mode you select. The Audi sits middle of the road in noise suppression and ride compliance, but if all-wheel drive is a major prerequisite, it's a hard one to look past. Jaguar 2 is making some noise in the junior luxury segment. The R Sport model driven here sits as the enthusiast pick of this bunch, loaded with torque vectoring technology and extensive use of aluminium in its underpinnings. At $68,900, the Jag is lineball with the Mercedes on price, fitted with a 2-litre petrol engine that makes a formidable 177 kilowatts. There is something altogether cool about this Jaguar. You get inside, uh, there's all these lovely angles, you feel like you're sitting right inside the car. You put your foot on the brake and the start-stop button pulses like a heartbeat. And you press it and all the magic happens. You've got the centre uh, shift dial that raises out of the dashboard and all the different systems come to life. Fortunately, it's not all smoke and mirrors. There's quite a bit of tech that's gone into this car. Jaguar hasn't wanted to spare any expense. So in doing that, it's been quite resourceful as well. It's pinched the front end from the Jaguar F-Type, so this car has the same double front wishbone suspension. That means it's gonna have that inherent sportiness of the F-Type, coupled with what Jaguar claims is class-topping luxury for this segment. And it definitely feels right from the get-go. The petrol engine itself is a really nice unit, right up there with the, the peak contenders here, and it has a lovely linearity to the way it puts its power to the ground. Where the Jaguar sets itself apart is sporty driving. 
it's really taken the position of the BMW as the sporty competitor in this bunch. Uh, for one, the steering's really lively and accurate. It's got a lovely positive turn-in feel, and the body sticks really well to the ground. Unlike others that can skip over mid-corner bumps, the Jaguar always feels composed and settled in faster driving. Drawbacks? Well, the immediate drawback from all that sportiness is that it's not quite as compliant as the likes of the Benz. And being traditionally a luxury segment, it's not likely to appease all buyers in that regard. My other reservation about the steering is that while it is really nice and positive on initial turn-in, as you put lock into the steering wheel, it seems to have too much bite and you're sort of constantly making mid-corner corrections to adjust to that. But once you do, really nice car to drive fast. The Jaguar loses points for interior presentation, along with the fact it misses out on attention to detail pieces like height adjustable front seat belts. Its rear seat back is also heavily compromised by bolstering on the outer pews. The BMW 3 Series has been lightly updated in time for this comparison, with most changes occurring under the bonnet. The 330i sits in the middle of the lineup, priced from $69,900. There are usually three things that you can expect from a rear drive BMW sedan. A, it's going to steer well, which this one does. It's really well calibrated the steering, it's got a lovely fluid motion to it, and it reacts really well to driver input. B, it's going to go well, and this one really picks up quite nicely for a four cylinder engine. Zero to 100 in just 5.8 seconds, and it's actually got quite an endearing note for a four pot engine. And C, it's going to handle really well. With, the, with its rear drive bias, the 3 Series really holds its own through corners. But that's not merely enough in this segment, particularly with how competitive it is now. And there's a couple of drawbacks with the BMW that really stand out against the likes of the Mercedes and the Jaguar. For one, it's the noisiest car here in terms of road noise. Um, and also, it's quite noisy over bumps. The suspension makes quite a bit of noise when you hit the sharper stuff, especially. The other drawback is the interior. In person, it just doesn't quite feel special enough for a $70,000 car. While that may seem a little rich, in this company the BMW loses marks for hard scratchy plastics, a bland steering wheel, manual handbrake and a rear seat compromised by excessive bolstering on the outer pews, similar to the Jag. A choppy ride also detracts from the cabin ambience. Then there's the Lexus IS200T. Comfortably the cheapest vehicle here at $65,500, it is fitted with unique features such as adaptive cruise control and standard heated and ventilated front seats. So, the question is, if you bundle all that tech and safety equipment into a car, does that make it automatically a luxury car? Well, not necessarily, but in the case of the Lexus, it really does work as an everyday luxury offering. Impressively, it's the only one of these five cars here on offer that doesn't actually have a squeak or a rattle while you're driving along. It's one of the quietest cars on offer, and its suspension does a really nice job of absorbing the bumps underneath you. In saying that though, does the Lexus set any new standards uh, in its driving behavior? Not really. It's middle of the road uh, in terms of driving dynamics. It's probably at the lower end of the scale, if anything. Um, its steering feels a little bit artificial, and while it does do a good job of holding onto the road, it doesn't really excel in any one way. The 200T's biggest drawback is its engine. Despite strong credentials on paper, it was the slowest and thirstiest vehicle on test, a factor influenced by its hefty 1680 kilogram curb weight, a 200 kilogram surplus on most competitors. The Lexus made up brownie points with its soft supportive seats and plush interior, but lost ground on functionality and attention to detail, its cramped rear seat and narrow boot space. But for those with a long-term view of ownership, the IS boasts the best resale value and is backed by an excellent reliability record. We finish with the Mercedes C250, a former Drive Car of the Year winner and comfortably the best seller in this segment. Priced at $68,900, the C250 is the least powerful offering and features the worst power to weight ratio of any vehicle tested, but in a luxury sense it is arguably all the car you could ever want. It's quite easy to see why the C-Class has been so popular. It really is luxury personified in the driver's seat. For one, it's really quiet, it's comfortably the most compliant car of the bunch here, and it drives really well. It's not the most sportiest car, but then it's balanced between sportiness and comfort more than makes up for that. The engine and transmission are quite a match in normal driving. The auto really makes great use of the engine, uh, keeps it in the sweet spot 
at all times and it means that the car never really feels like it's struggling when it's going up to speed. It's quite a refined engine as well. You will get the odd instance where you get a little bit of whirring as it's picking up speed, but otherwise um, it puts its power down really nicely and is nice and linear in its delivery. As I said before, it's the pick of this bunch in terms of noise suppression, but also in its compliance. The steering is immune to mid-corner kickback, but yet it's responsive, there's plenty of feedback coming through the wheel, and it really endows the C-Class with a real luxury feel that other competitors just simply cannot match. And even in this new company, I've got to say, the Merc still feels a class above in terms of a luxury brief. Yes, you get a sportier drive in something like the Jaguar or the BMW, but in terms of its intended brief, well, the Merc is pretty hard to beat. A well-crafted interior and excellent build quality are both major hallmarks of the C-Class. It has more airbags than any other vehicle tested at nine and boasts full autonomous emergency braking where some competitor offerings only feature partial functionality. A tight rear seat and short seat squabs are both detractions for the baby bends. The increased competition in the junior luxury segment means that your dollar goes further than ever before. In all five of these vehicles, you've got technology, refinement and safety features that weren't even seen in top flight luxury cars five years ago. So which of these vehicles blends those three features the best? Well, we can't look past the reigning champion, the Mercedes-Benz C-Class. It was a decision that wasn't taken lightly. Despite the Jaguar and the Audi both putting up strong fights, it was a C-Class that came away as the best rounded luxury car for this price point.